everyone see my screen okay? Give me a thumbs up. Perfect, real thumbs up. And if you, yeah, um, if you have any questions throughout, please um, feel free to interrupt me. I love being interrupted or write something in the chat and Jasmine will interrupt me. I don't care who interrupts me. Um, we wanna make this as much of a discussion as possible. So um, I've already introduced myself so we can just hop right in to um, Planet Microbes 10th edition, deep ocean sediments and really slow microbes. So we've been to space, we've been to dry environments and hydrothermal vents, but um, now we're doing something a little bit different in the deep biosphere, as they call it, like deep in the earth sediment. So to get started, we need to do a little bit of background information and journey to the bottom of the ocean and how that bottom of the ocean actually gets formed. And even though in some places this can be 11,000 meters deep, the, the sediment forming at the bottom of the ocean starts with the phytoplankton in the sunlit surface ocean. So that's here in this layer in the diagram on the right. And this water is populated by all these tiny little photosynthetic critters and the larger zooplankton who eat them. And those organisms grow, they photosynthesize, they produce the oxygen and every other breath that we take. They're super important for keeping the planet a habitable place. Um, we like them, they're great. We've talked about them at Planet Microbes before, but um, all, all phytoplankton must meet their maker at some point. And what happens to these phytoplankton and other critters who eat them who are floating in the surface ocean when they die? They aggregate into what's called marine snow. And this is a super zoomed in micrograph of a little piece of marine snow. If you kind of squint your eyes, you can sort of see a little bit of yellow coloration here. Um, that's leftover pigment chlorophyll from these phytoplankton and they've all kind of mushed together into this heavy particle and that will ultimately sink down very very slowly through the ocean down the several miles in some cases that it takes to get to the very bottom where they will settle and um, form the sediment. Um, so over thousands and thousands of years. That is what is forming and, and pushing the sediment down even deeper into the um, parts of the ocean floor and the Earth's interior that will ultimately form magma and get recirculated and, and come back out. So the, the interesting thing is that this is happening super, super slowly. So it's forming about two centimeters every thousand years. So if um, comparing that to like a, a, a snowstorm that we just had in New York, um, it's, it's a lot faster. So the sediment is taking a really long time to form and um, rain its way down from the surface ocean to depth. And ocean sediment 101, why do we actually care about these? These phytoplankton are dead. They've been traveling down um, weeks in some cases to reach the bottom of the ocean. They're forming at two centimeters every thousand years. Why do we care about something that happens so slowly? One of the reasons that scientists are really interested in ocean sediments is because the, if you drill down into the ocean floor, several, several meters deep, they would form sort of like a, a, a tree ring and you could go back in Earth's history and look at what was happening in the surface of the ocean based on what had settled into that sediment over thousands and thousands of years. So these sediment cores and looking at them through, through time really are almost like a window into Earth's history, similar to tree rings. But if tree rings lived for millions of years, so as that sediment rains down, it's pushing the older sediment down deeper and the newer sediment is forming on top. So you can take these sediment cores that are um, tens, twenties, thirties meters deep and reconstruct using chemistry and the fossils that are present in this core to reconstruct what Earth's climate was like in the past. So this is an image that um, is taken from chemistry, chemical data from a sediment core, many, many sediment cores pooled together in the ocean. And here on the horizontal axis, you can see 
um, the sediment cores go back 5.5 million years. And that's several meters deep in the, in the ocean sediment. And this wiggly line is um, a chemical proxy for temperature that's taken from preserved fossils that have rained down over those millions of years. And you can see that over time, the temperature um, oscillations have gotten much bigger and the average temperature has overall gotten much warmer. And each of these little um, peaks and valleys is, a, is an ice age or a mini ice age. So just looking at the sediment data, you can reconstruct these amazing things about Earth's history. And it's basically like a time machine that takes us back in time. So that's one reason why scientists are interested in ocean sediment um, as a window into the past, which helps us predict how um, Earth will fare in the future in light of climate change. But even though we can reconstruct what happened 5.5 million years ago by looking at this ocean sediment, we still have a really limited understanding of what processes are happening in that ocean sediment right now as we speak throughout the, um, throughout the column of sediment. And this is important because um, not knowing what's going on is important because this, um, this layer of sediment in what is essentially the Earth's crust is sort of like a, a gatekeeper that um, is, is a control on what chemistry happens in the surface ocean versus the chemistry that happens in the Earth's deep subsurface where the magma is hot and all of these interesting chemical reactions are happening. I'm seeing a couple of things in the chat, so I'll just take a second to check. Oh yeah, um, Clara asks a great question about microplastics. So microplastics are everywhere that we have looked so far. They are in the deepest point of the ocean, the Mariana Trench, which is 11,000 meters deep. Um, they saw like a, a, a plastic bag floating down there, which is um, really sobering. They're in the, the highest um, point on Earth and the most remote places on Earth. So yes, microplastics are everywhere. Um, they do take longer to sink because they're buoyant, but they're, um, they can be colonized by microbes, which um, cause them to sink faster. So yeah, um, hundreds of years, thousands of years from now, um, they will probably be able to use the layer of um, sediment that contains microplastics as what we call in geochemistry, the golden spike that marks the um, Anthropocene. So that's kind of sobering, but yeah, microplastics for sure are down there. Let me minimize that. So, but the, so th this is recording what, what happens over millions of years, but there are currently chemical reactions that are happening right now that scientists have very little understanding of. And um, who is responsible for all of this action that's happening in ocean sediments and is responsible for these chemical transformations that you see um, in this recent review article about um, the importance of these deep, um, these deep sediments. You could probably guess um, who is important based on the uh, the, the mission of planet microbes, but it is bacteria and um, archaea and microbes who live down there who are, even though they are buried deep beneath the surface of the ocean and the sun and new energy and food being produced, um, they are slowly doing something down there, but we have very little understanding of what that is, um, what's limiting these microbes growth, even though we have evidence that they exist up to eight miles deep in the sediment. So something is happening down there, but we have very little understanding of what it is. So we, might, we know microbes are there, but what's the problem with life in the sediment eight miles deep in far away from the sun? What's the, what would limit your growth down there? Message in the chat. Energy, exactly, yeah, that's one thing. You are so far away from photosynthetic 
organisms. And while there are some organisms that are chemosynthetic and can make their own food, the deeper you get in that sediment, the further and further away you get from energy sources that can fuel your growth. So that's one thing. It's dark. Um, pressure, exactly. Pressure is great. Pressure definitely um, can limit um, the, the organism's ability to have their enzymes do what they need to do. Sibel says organic carbon. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing as um, sort of related to energy. So a lot of organisms that are producing that organic carbon, phytoplankton, they need the sun. That's miles and miles away at the surface of the ocean. So yeah, temperature too. All these are great things. And put together, what, what this sort of paints a picture of is that it's a super harsh environment down there. Um, it's cold, high pressure, no energy, far away from food, um, not a very hospitable place to, to grow. But nevertheless, microbes persist down there and we, we have no idea if they are important for global biogeochemistry. And that is what um, these scientists in the paper that we're discussing today have sought out to test. So um, I really liked the quote um, in the significant statement of this paper. And I just copied and pasted that here. And it's sort of summarizes what we just talked about. This sedimentary subsurface is this really harsh environment and scientists describe it as a place where microbes race to their death. So they're sinking in the sediment further and further away from energy sources, um, slowly um, running out of the, the, the energy that they need to live. And this gets severely diminished with increasing depth and age. But as we'll see, as we discuss this paper, um, it, it can't limit everything and microbes are there they're alive, they're active, um, they're just really, really slow, waiting for the right environment. Before I hop into a summary of the paper, does anyone have any questions or comments or philosophical musings on what it means to be alive? Kyle, this is Jagdeep. <laughs> Just, just Hi. Think, yeah. thinking through this, right? These are ocean microbiome. Mm -hmm. I would expect that there are some genres which are very unique to the ocean environment compared to terrestrial, right? Mm -hmm. with, the, mm -hmm. with, with the climate change, it's no brainer that we are seeing more bacteria, right? I mean, they are just abundant. But then with the climate change on the surface of Earth, right, in, in the terrestrial space, maybe this is really a window for us to think about how do we utilize them to improve any process, right? It could be in the medical field, in agriculture field. Do we know any of studies related to that um, or any insight into that aspect of these ocean microbiome? Sort of how they could be co-opted for lack of a better term to do something that we need them to do. Right. So like if there is any study going on that, hey, these are very unique to ocean, but can they survive on terrestrial environment, for example, right? First would be that. Then if so, how can we make them do what we want to do, which is improve upon any, any kind of industrial process yeah. where microbe could play a role? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And people are trying to use um, use microbes for all sorts of things to because they're often a a more sustainable, a cheaper um, and a less environmentally damaging way to do certain things. In our last planet microbes, we talked about how bacteria could be used to mine rare earth elements from space. The limiting factor with all of these things are they grow so slowly and it's super hard to make um, make these critters grow grow faster than they do. And so on a human time scale, I think it's hard to to make them do something in a way that is fast enough for us to um, to to benefit from it on time scales that we are we are living on. Um, and they're, they're super hard to grow. Um, 
So I think that's the limitation, but people are definitely positing them, them being microbes as, as these types of strategies. That's a super um, gen space type question. Lots of people are thinking about how they can be used in biotechnology or in art or how we can co-opt these microbes to do our bidding more or less. So another, um, oh, a bunch of questions. So, yep, we know what, oh, similar microbes found in deep dark caves or other harsh environments, but on land. So as we will see, the, the microbes that we are, that they're finding in these ocean sediments are pretty unique or endemic to these environments. They're only, only found on, um, in these ocean sediments. However, there's a saying in environmental microbiology, and that is everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. And that is trying to get at this idea that every microbes are so small and they're everywhere. And really what they are waiting for is for the environment to create the unique settings that enables the um, critters that are adapted to thrive there to grow, whether that is the deep ocean sediment or your armpit or your gut or your cat. Um, everything is everywhere, but that environment will select for what grows. So maybe they're everywhere, but we just haven't found them or the environmental chemical conditions aren't quite right. Another question from um, Sequoia. Jump in if I, I have trouble reading under pressure. So jump in if I'm missing a question. Um, is there anything else besides microbes? What kind of microbes are there? Yeah, there's in the surface, um, there are like wormy things and little um, critters that sort of, that are multicellular, but, but dig. But those I don't think go super deep. And we do know that they're, um, what type of microbes they are from sequencing their genomes. And what does this mean for possibilities of life on other planets? Another great question. Every time you find um, some critters that live in a place that's super inhospitable, um, the first thing people think of is, could this be evidence of life existing in um, planets that are really far from the sun or planets that are covered in an ocean, things like that. So yeah, definitely this is something that astrobiologists are thinking of. Um, Kasha asks, are scientists tracking how far these microbes travel across the ocean floor or are they staying put? Um, the ocean floor does move, but at about the rate that your fingernails grow. So it's super, super slow. Um, but technically, yeah, they could move really slowly. That's the, that's the speed at which Earth's tectonic plates are, are shifting. So way too slow for us to track. Um, and then Sibel says, a lot of things with them, but how often have, um, do we have to do a lot of basic science alongside that and figure out who they are and what they do before we can utilize them. Yeah, exactly. And how we can grow them. That's often in these, uh, to put it colloquially, these weird microbes, the limitation is we just don't know what they need to grow. And what I think is really cool is that there are a lot of microbes that when you can't get them to grow in culture, it's because they rely on symbiotic relationships. So scientists are, are going down there and they're putting these bacteria in a test tube but what they're missing is that these organisms exist in tight, um, tight associations, sometimes actually physically touching with other organisms who they rely on to, to grow. And that's just the missing piece, of, missing piece of the puzzle. Get by with a little help from their friends. And Clara asks about um, engineering microbes to break down plastic in the ocean environment. Um, Definitely, yeah, there are, I've seen a few papers about um, microbes who can break down hydrocarbons or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, or, or break down plastic. So people are doing research on that. We haven't talked about microplastics. That's a good thing to add to my list for planet microbes, future planet microbes. Mealworms, waxworms, break down plastic, 
that's good to know. Hopefully we can use them to do that in the future as it's probably one of the most pressing um, sustainability questions facing Earth. And finally, have we been able to grow any of them? Yeah, a lot of them, I think scientists can grow. Um, uh, these ones that we will talk about today, I'm actually not sure if they have them in culture, but they grow, they grow super slowly and require unique conditions. These were amazing questions, keep them coming. And um, if, you, if anything is confusing about the figures of the paper or you had any, any questions about truly anything that the paper inspired in you, please feel free to um, jump in. And then we'll just go over sort of a brief overview of the paper and then we will break out into discussion groups and discuss a few both scientific and philosophical questions that um, I thought of or whatever questions or tangents you wanna go off on. And then we will all reconvene together after 10 minutes or so, depending on how much time we have. What time is it? 7.11. And then we'll all come back together and discuss again as a group, just so you have um, a floor plan of what, what's gonna happen next. Okay, so this paper, these intrepid scientists went out to the very cold Greenland Sea. You can see um, on a map, oop, it's cut off, sorry about that, but you can see the, the United States here and Greenland. And these red dots are where they took um, sediment cores off of the, um, the Mons Ridge. And this word that look, looks like it's Icelandic that I can't pronounce, but they went along this ridge in the ocean and collected um, deep um, sediment core samples. And let me move, move your faces. So what they were looking for is this particular geochemical environment along um, as you go down into the sediment and um, conversely deeper through time um, where it creates this chemical environment called the nitrate ammonium transition zone. And this is the exact slice in both depth and sort of um, time history where you have nitrate NO3 minus diffusing down from sediments that are higher up and you have ammonium diffusing up from sediments that are deeper and where they, where they meet, you form the nitrate ammonium transition zone or the NATZ. And did anyone catch in the paper how long it takes for sediment that's being deposited to get pushed down into the sweet spot of the NATZ? Feel free to put it in, in the chat or, or shout it out. Exactly, Louise, 80,000 years. And Sabrina, um, 80,000 years. That's a really long time that a microbe that has been deposited on the surface of, this, of the ocean floor to make it all the way down to this NATZ. 80,000 years, that's a really long time. Um, so what these scientists did is they were interested in the biogeochemistry of this ocean sediment and in particular, the NATZ. So at all of these four sites, they took cores and they analyzed the chemistry. Um, and then this is a little busy, so we'll just zoom in on one of these. And the reason why the, they were interested in first looking at the biogeochemistry is that these chemical signatures can give us a clue about what the organisms who live there are doing in this sediment based on the compounds that they're taking up and how they diminish and the compounds that they spit out as waste products. That redox chemistry can clue us in to who's there and their, their physiology, their metabolism and how they do what they do. So Sabrina asks in the chat, was there any significance to mainly finding NATZ sites on continental slopes and mid-ocean ridges and do they not tend to form in planes? That's such a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but maybe we, maybe if we look at the map, we can tell. 
where the, of, of course I cut off the, the map on my PowerPoint, but these are the places where they also found an NATZ. And so not all of the, the, these yellow dots on the map um, are also regions where um, from past work in sediment cores, they found an NATZ. So it looks like these aren't all um, located in mid-ocean ridges. This could be a plane, this one down off the coast of um, Mexico by the equator. So it looks like they, the NATZ um, was widespread throughout the ocean bottom, and it's not always um, in mid-ocean ridges. Um, so mid-ocean ridges are sort of a special place in, in the ocean, and they're places where the tectonic plates of Earth are um, slowly spreading apart, and then magma from down below bubbles up as these plates separate, and that's where you get the mountains. These are also places where um, you get hydrothermal vents and lots of unique biological activity. So these are these are special places in the ocean, but the NATZ seems like it's not limited to this environment. Great question. Alrighty, zooming in on the chemistry and how this can clue us in to the biology. So starting here on the far left, um, as you go down the vertical axis, you get deeper and deeper into the sediment. And this is in meters below the surface of the, um, of the ocean floor. So um, right at the surface to four meters deep. And then each parameter they looked at is across the horizontal axis. So first they are looking at um, organic carbon, which is, I think it was Cybele who mentioned there's a lack of organic carbon as you get deeper. That's the food source for microbes. So as you um, get deeper, that total organic carbon goes down. What does that mean? No food for the critters who live there. The next thing they looked at was oxygen, which is modeled um, or observed in this sort of salmon colored line. Um, as you go from surface to deep, that oxygen rapidly plummets. What this means, uh, obviously no oxygen. And why is oxygen important? That is what organisms who respire, it's a great energy source that we can use to fuel chemical reactions. So as you get deeper in the sediment, um, no food, no oxygen. They also, um, because they were interested in the um, nitrate ammonium transition zone, they looked at the concentration of nitrate and the concentration of ammonium. And what they saw is that in this particular region um, where oxygen is low and TOC is low, there's this inflection point between nitrate and ammonium, the NATZ. And then they also found all of this evidence of a particular type of metabolic activity called animox and the organisms who perform it. So that's what these, um, these, these next, next graphs are. Has anyone heard of animox before in their own readings or it's sort of a new, um, it was a new sort of hot topic in microbial physiology that came out a couple of maybe less than a decade ago. Um, and it stands for anaerobic ammonium oxidation. And that's how you get animox. So I wanna preface this by saying that the nitrogen cycle is super, super complicated. If you would have asked me to draw out the, the nitrogen cycle. I probably would have been able to do it um, when I was still a grad student, but I absolutely could not, could not do it now. There are all of these different transformations. It spans um, like 10 levels of redox state. Um, and there are all of these different microbes that are responsible for doing all of these different transformations between different nitrogen species. Um, super, super complicated, but really interesting. And they're finding new ones all the time as evidenced by by Animox. So yeah, just, just to say, um, even I have to Google image search the nitrogen cycle every time I, I have to think about it. So 
they found all of this evidence in the NATZ of Animox, all of the ingredients that were, were necessary that were, were there. So if you look at this diagram, what you need um, as an organism to do Animox, which is a way that um, microbes can, without oxygen, um, use those nitrogen compounds for energy to grow in the absence of oxygen. Um, so what from this diagram are the key ingredients that you need um, to do this reaction if you follow the arrows? So you need um, nitrate to be transformed into nitrite. And you also need ammonium or ammonia. And then those come together by these bacteria that can do these Animox reactions. And they'll take energy from that and grow. And the byproduct will be um, dinitrogen gas. And how does this relate to the, the chemistry of the NATZ that they found? Well, the NATZ is this exact point where the organisms that grow there, here is the NATZ in this gray bar, they've got nitrate coming from the surface that gets transformed by other microbes that we don't have time to talk about into nitrite. That's one ingredient. And then you've got ammonium coming from below. And right at this inflection point is that sweet spot where um, Animox can happen and fuel these very unique microbes and enable them to grow. So it's this, um, this, this perfect chemical spot that creates this niche. So these, these organisms that can do this are, like I said before, they're everywhere, but the environment is selecting for them in this particular geochemical sweet spot. That is this really narrow band that occurs all over the ocean floor. Any questions? Any questions so far? Nitrogen cycle, super complicated. Okie dokie. Well, feel free to jump in if you do. I'm almost done here. So they their next question, finding this evidence for these, these really special bacteria that are capable of this unique metabolism to get energy in this harsh environment, they do um, gene and genome sequencing to look at who's there. They have great evidence of what they're doing. Um, so they looked for who was there. And these graphs are again, going deep with, or going with depth in the sediment cores and looking for particular, um, this one particular bacterium that they found, Scalindua sedimines. Um, and this is an Animox bacterium and they find that it peaks in each of these cores, in each of the sites they tested, right at that NATZ. And that is shown here in, um, in red. The warmer colors are higher abundance of this organism. And at each core, the NATZ was in a different spot, but it, it corresponds with, with this geochemical sweet spot. But the question is, there's more of them, but are they actually are they actually growing? Have they migrated there from some other region in the sediment core? Um, are they actually are they actually doing are they actually doing anything? Do we care? Are these biogeochemically important on a on a grander scale? And so they sought to do that next, doing what I think is a pretty pretty nifty technique to assess whether these bacteria were actively replicating. And what they did is look at, um, use a tool called IREP. And this takes advantage of the fact that bacterial genomes can start, start replicating um, always at one point on their circular genomes. Um, and that replication sort of forms a bubble where you can see um, the, the genome dividing in advance of that cell dividing. So it's growing out at both ends until you get two completed replicated rings and then they pop off and the bacterium can replicate. And for really fast critters, they can start doing this in, in tandem. So they can be replicating as they're replicating, 
they're starting to replicate for the next um, round of divisions. So they're thinking ahead to, um, to their next daughter cells down the line before they've even started replicating um, the one above that. So you can take advantage of the fact that DNA will be layered up in four layers here to get a sense of whether bacteria in any place you look are actively dividing. So if you were to sequence all of these, um, all of the genomes from um, a population, wherever you wanted to look, in this sort of schematic image, which population would be, would you find evidence that they were growing fast? And which would you find evidence that they're growing slow based on how bacteria replicate their genomes? Which one is fast and which one is slow? Or did that not make sense, that explanation not make sense at all? Oh yeah, lots of lefts, exactly. So because if you were to sequence all of these, you would see multiple layers of um, sequence coverage stacked up sort of leading from that origin of replication site. So the more, more layering you saw of that, that would be great evidence that these organisms are, are actively dividing and replicating their genomes. Whereas if they were growing more slowly, you would see less overlap. Um, and that would be evidence that they weren't growing quite as fast. So what they found was that as soon as these organisms, um, these animox um, bacteria get to the NATZ, they're sort of biding their time as they go down in the sediment over 80,000 years until they get to the NATZ where a whopping 32% are, are actively dividing at that time, which um, for, these, for these sediments that are really remote and have no nutrients or very low, poor energy sources, this is a lot. Um, so they are, they are actively doing their thing down there. So in summary, they put this all together and what I think is really fascinating is that these Animox populations are, are, are sitting in stasis, doing nothing but um, keeping their, their one cell, um, taking out the garbage and doing cell maintenance, but they're not, they're not dividing, they're not growing, they're in stasis for 80,000 years until they get to that sweet spot and then they, they start growing. Still probably very slowly, but but they start um, and they're using ammonium from below, nitrate from above, and that environment is selecting for these special organisms and sort of zooming out to the ocean at large. What this means is that these organisms are sort of the, the gatekeepers or the, or the filter that takes nitrate from above Here's the, here's the NATZ Animox bacteria here. Um, they're taking ammonium from below and they are, are essentially filtering out the ammonium that would have made it from the sediment into the surface ocean and exerting this strong um, biogeochemical control on the, on the chemistry of the ocean at large. Um, and they're doing it really slowly. So these scientists found that essentially no ammonium was able to make it past the NATZ because these critters were taking all of it and using it to grow. So that's, um, that's pretty impressive, I think at least. And so with that, um, we have some discussion questions that sort of start with the more philosophical. I thought this raised really interesting questions about what does it mean to be alive. If you are in stasis and you're not growing or dividing, does that mean that you're alive? Are you not alive? Are you cryogenically frozen? And does this mean that we have to change definitions about what it means to be alive or from species to species or organism to organism? Um, and a number of other questions 
as well. So we will divide you into um, breakout groups and then um, I will pop into each group and then we'll all reconvene in 10, 15 minutes and uh, um, have a discussion together. But before we do that, and as Jasmine is doing the magic to make discussion groups, does anyone have any, any questions or comments or musings on this? 